This is for heaven. Um... What it is. What's up? More Game of Thrones content to cut. Uh, I'm sorry for not doing an episode 5 review. I know I did a 4 one that was literally just pretty much walking through everything in chronological order. Um, number 5, I was at my hometown and I watched it. But I just... The schedule, the way the timeline worked out, it's going to be tough for me to get a video done uh, of any quality that day. And uh, I, I guess the next day I didn't feel like I'll be doing it. So <laughs> we're here doing this one. Episode 6. Uh, massive, massive change. It almost felt like a spinoff. Like, it almost felt like a spinoff of a spinoff. The thematics that transfer over eventually make a bridge, but for, like, five minutes there of that kind of cold open they go with, um, it felt like a whole new series. And then you, like, kind of start seeing new faces. Uh, I mean, literally, Renair, it opens up with Renair, and it's like, I'm gonna get into spoilers, by the way, because how would I do a review without doing it? But, um, we get into Renair, who's having a kid, and we're like, holy fuck. I mean, Renair says she pretty much hated kids, or at least the principle of having them. So it's like, okay, she's having a kid, so this kid should be, I guess, he got, excuse me, he's got nest. Uh, he's got nest in the court, and ends up being just a pretty plain old thingy. Just the kid's another of many kids she apparently has. And uh, the queen ask her to bring the kid up to her for really what appears to be no reason to degrade her. Like, I literally appear... I, for what I could gather, she wanted to see the baby, wanted to, I think, to kind of degrade uh, Renera by having the kid be taken away from her pretty much as soon as it was born. Uh, just kind of demean her a little bit. I don't think... And eventually I was, like, going wild thinking, like, she's gonna try to kill the kid? But she brings the kid up there to where her and Viserys, who is looking old as hell. I mean, like... But seriously, died in any moment. I mean, that's it was like future Gohan in the damn sleeve, uh, just kind of flapping. <laughs> uh, it appears that he looks to be pretty much about where he was at before. Uh, it just appears to be an older man, so I'm guessing that amputating the the arm did work, I guess. But uh, anyway, so I thought that for a second she's gonna bring the kill of the kid, but apparently, I think she's kind of either. Either she wanted to do it to degrade Renera and not have even allow her to spend pretty much her first moments with the baby uh, in peace, or she knew Renera to be a fuck and literally try to go up the castle, uh, which was a very startling uh, cinematography. In that those opening few minutes was amazing, by the way. Um, a very startling. I, I guess my my intention was degrading, but a very. Uh, brutal moment where this woman who just had a kid and literally had to push after birth out uh goes from doing that to walking up a flight of stairs which i imagine is very painful uh and is out of pure animosity against olivia cook slash allison hightower i love to refer to characters by their actresses um she just says fuck it i'm taking that kid up there i'm not allowing her to see my kid without me being present so that happens uh i'm not gonna go chronological but that was i think a excellent uh beginning we kind of see the same we got like this literally the first thing we see is print for a nearest face it's coupled with this turnaround and then this almost freeze frame uh zoom in on olivia cook as allison and we see his older viserys he's still who he is and i think we uh, also got kristen cole being the one who opened the door for an error uh he tried to keep it professional as he could do uh, and we kind of get like this pretty, at least at the moment, it felt evident that uh, Renera pretty much moved on from Cole. As we could also see about, I think, 10 minutes later, Cole didn't really move on. Well, maybe about 20, 25 minutes later. Cole has not moved on from Renera whatsoever at all. Um, so I think it might be most prudent to kind of look, because it's always good to format these. I think it might be most prudent to look at this in such a way where we think about each character, how they kind of came from the first half, almost the prequel to this to this spinoff, this new season almost, uh, to where we at our to where we're at in episode six. So starting from the top, Renera Targaryen. Uh Renera has not learned anything about anything at the same time. 
feels like she's slowly closer to the truth that uh, Rhaenyris, or Rhaenys, uh kind of presented to her. So Rhaenyra has had three kids, all three, well, at least two of the kids, uh, clearly <laughs> are not uh, of both Viserys plus uh, Targaryen plus Valerian blood. They're both brown haired. Um, I was it's funny. I was just thinking about earlier about um, Joffrey and the other two uh, Baratheons that were in. Because I was listening to a podcast, a Game of Thrones slash House of Dragon uh, podcast, and basically he was taking on a listener question because I guess in the in the uh, I, I want to say the send off to episode five. I guess they kind of I, I know I, I refuse to watch the episode previews. So I don't want to be spoiled by anything that might happen in this. But from what I can gather, I guess they kind of likened that there were going to be kids of uh, Renaris Ra- in this episode. I don't know if they mentioned they're going to be brown hair or not. I, I knew that Amen was leaked. I'm not sure or not leaked, but uh, teased. I don't know if any of Renaris kids have been. I assume not, but. Based on the question I was asked to the podcast presenter, it was basically saying, kind of, kind of, it was like asking kind of what leads into a Targaryen looking the way they do because the, and it was, it was using the Rob Baratheon kind of as like, what, what's the founding, like why was more questions asked basically? Because Rob Baratheon is a parent that's supposed to have strong seed as a presented uh, pose so why would have why wouldn't more people ask about all three kids as i remember all three kids of cersei lannisters were blonde so even the father this isn't like normal you know we we think of it like normal you know genetics dominant recessive but this is supposed to be i think a little bit different in this world basically like the way kids are supposed to pop out supposed to be a little bit different and I think Viserys' half ass rationalization for why those kids don't look anything like a Targaryen kid should, a Targaryen slash Valerian kid should, um, is I think his half ass rationalization was actually kind of what a lot of the people did. A lot of people that were trying to, I guess, kind of just tunnel vision it were rationalizing the Baratheon slash Lannister spawns is that sometimes in this world apparently sometimes you can have a I think the way Viserys put it was a brown mare and a silver stallion pop out a brown kid a brown horse kid and Allison tore that apart immediately but uh (laughs) I think it's how some of the people get down without thinking about it apparently for some reason, I guess it wasn't, it was pretty much very rare for someone to really think about the first two kids as not being Lannister's, uh, Lannister, Targaryen spawn. Like, people thought about it, especially people that were closer to the throne, such as Olivia Cook's character, or, or Larys's, or Damon, or people who basically had the the free will to think about that without fearing for their lives. Um, I guess the normal person just even didn't even dare to bring that up in case, I guess, of being killed. So maybe more people thought about it, but just nobody vocalized it. Whatever. So anyway, Renera Targaryen, Nyra, fucked Heron Strong um, and produced three kids. Three. She fucked him three times. So at this point, I'm like thinking, like, this is still a very naive individual. And we see some of that naivete, that uh, unwillingness to kind of play by the politics of the throne uh, that we got from young Naira that is still popping up to this day. I think she has the sense of duty that you need to have, but there's so much unwillingness to really focus in on what this was all about that popped up again throughout this episode, even as a grown woman. Um my just thought was like, why not just fuck somebody outside of the Iron Throne? I know like the premise is that like you want to fuck somebody yourself like, a little bit of proximity so you can't really, you know, I mean it's close so you can like keep an eye on them. Um, it's unlikely that he would tell because it's code of honor, all that stuff. And I don't really remember it too well, but apparently I guess she she enjoyed Heron Strong. 
I don't, I, I never took, because I can, in my mind, I can think about where that scene was at, but, like, I can't think of it in such a way where I'm like, she adored Heron Strong. Like, that would be, like, your second fuck if, you didn't, if Cole didn't work out. I don't know. But it's very clear that, like, she's not exclusively fucking these dudes just to have it be a matter of love. It's almost a fulfillment. Like, a fulfillment to herself, uh, a denial of the way the throne is supposed to work, uh, a fulfillment of kind of the promise she made with old buddy who's been able to just slurp whatever he wants. She even kind of mentioned that. Literally said, like, think just almost bar for bar. I forgot which word she said, though. But just uh, suck up whatever he wanted that was all around. Dudes, alcohol, whatever. Uh, that's the promise she made with him from the jump, even after the night of kissing got his ass kicked. Um, so... It's clear, like, it's... <laughs> I, I don't know if she... To skip ahead a little bit, there's a scene where, basically, Harmon gets sent off. Um, and I don't know if she didn't show emotion to Harwin, uh, who was clearly emotional seeing his kids for what would the last time. Um, I don't know if she tried to hide that emotion so as to not let the kids know what was up, or she just literally just did not give that much of a shit about Harwin. It does kind of have to tie into the last scene, a quarter scene that she had with Kristen Cole, where my thought process last episode was that she pushed Cole away in such a way because she was trying to basically let him down easily. But then I think she was like fucking, what, 14, 15 at that point, And she was a pretty brutal character in terms of honesty. I think she was just like, motherfucker, this is how the world works. I can't be with you. It's just that fucking simple. <laughs> and with this scene, I think that's kind of how it is. I think she doesn't really give a shit about necessarily the way the realm works, per se. She's more just a matter of, this is my carnal desires. I want it this way. And the same way she had to tell Chris and Cole, hey, you decide, dick. You're fun. I enjoy you, but I'm not giving up post for you. It was the same thing with uh, Harmon. She's like, I mean, you had these three kids, but I'm not letting these kids like just go around thinking like, hey, this random, you know, just fucking do and see what. I just, I just been fucking, you know, I just been going around throwing that thing back on anybody, which she has been doing. Um, I, I thought I, I really thought she's gonna learn, like, see that Cole became a sociopath and decided to, like spread her wings a little bit, go outside the her general realm there, but uh, she did not nah, at all. That was not something she was interested in doing. So, outside of that, uh, some of the big Naira developments, uh, her relationship with uh, Allison is cooked. Like, I know they were pretty much after uh, she got knocked up by her dad, but after this, cooked. She did the best she could pretty much throw up a Hail Mary and put this uh, behind them so as to not get thrown out or potentially killed uh, for, I guess, producing the bastard. But that was not something she did to like really become friends with Allison again. She fucking loads Allison. Allison loads her. Uh, <laughs> Allison couldn't even pretend like she gave a shit about that offer. That's the funniest thing about it. She couldn't even fake the funk. And she didn't even wait to get back in the room with the king to tell her the king go fuck himself about that offer. I thought that was pretty funny. So, it's very clear that at this point, that relationship's untenable. And um, it's going to, I, mean, I haven't seen the preview. It's going to be, for a fact, likened by either Lairs or somebody else in King's Landing that Allison put the hit on uh, Harlan Strong. Let's get to Harvest Strong real quick because I think that's important. Uh, he's an extension of her in terms of relevancy, but it does matter for a lot of different reasons. So, so yeah, that's pretty much Harwin's episode. Um, his kids are a product of pretty much uh, their bastards. Their bastards that sit right by the throne, and their bastards that have a direct linkage to the throne. So. Their kids actually hold a uh, presence over Amon or Aegon. 
because since Viserys was ardent about Rhaenyra being the queen in waiting, that means her bloodline would theoretically have I, I guess theoretically would have presence over Aegon even if Rhaenyra herself died because theoretically Rhaenyra and Aegon should be on the same level but I guess because Queen the Queen spawns have precedence over Aegon even though Aegon by right by like official credence of the realm would have basically up next he wouldn't even have up next he's supposed to have now basically like after Viserys dies, he should have now, but essentially, at the very least, he should have next if Rhaenyra was to die, but essentially, it seems to be where this is Rhaenyra's bloodline wins, and basically, Allison Hightower's bloodline becomes, I guess, the equivalent of Raynus's, where it's just, they're Targaryens, but they're not the direct bloodline that will be up next. I guess that's how I that's how I took it. Based on the conversation that Allison Hightower had with Aegon, it seems to be that pretty much the bloodline was meant to where Jakaris would skip over Aegon in the case of basically after Rhaenyra goes, it would be her or him over Aegon. That's how I took it to be. I don't know. So that's pretty much Harwin. Harwin produced uh, some earth shattering bastards earth shattering really and um here's another night of the city watch that Renera decided to fuck very bad decision a really bad decision uh, <laughs> and uh, he got out of there they took him out so we'll see what the blowback of that is emotionally for Renera I mean the kids uh, uh the father of your kids off this planet the last moment that uh, you had with him in the building was one of the kids, I believe the oldest one, asking, is that my father that just walked through the building? Am I a bastard? And to that which Renera replied, you are a Targaryen, and that's all that matters. So <laughs> the worst answer I have ever heard to any question outside of the one Cole gave to, uh, to Emily Carey last episode is a top two. Uh, I'm tired as fuck. Um, I shouldn't have did this. I shouldn't have did this episode. I'm tired of shit. So we're gonna try to finish. I'm gonna try to do Renera and Olivia Cook. Allison, I'm gonna push that out, and then we'll come back to everybody else, I guess, later. Uh, Emma Darcy was fantastic. What this role was supposed to be. Essentially, and this this is the way I looked at this character. So essentially, what we had was. A malcontent that was breeding. Someone who was very disaffectionate towards everything that occurred in terms of the formalities of the realm. We've seen that with uh, Millie Alcox uh, right now or so many different times. She did not want to give kids. She was deathly afraid of giving kids. It seemed like at one point. Um, she didn't want to marry for the longest. She married a, basically a so she could have her fun um, still. You know, he has his fun. So they pretty much spat on the customs of the Iron Throne in a way. Um, number three, uh, she did not give really a damn if her kids were adjoined to the formalities of you're not supposed to fuck basically just random ass dudes on the block and produce those kids. Basically, bastards. You're not supposed to produce bastards. At least as a woman, uh, bastards were. Very commonplace for men, but producing bastards as a uh, a woman was very no no. We've seen it multiple times in this world. Um, what else? I mean, she just didn't want to play. She didn't want to play the politics, the the uh, inherited shit. She rather had her family together, everybody's to good, everybody's good to go, go to Dragonstone, protect their lives, then sit there and fight Olivia Cook for the throne, basically. She thought, I don't know if she thought it was a losing battle, but she thought it wasn't worth it. That's the simplest way to put it. And that's some, not something that we've seen a lot of queens or kings do. Just basically give up the throne and say, nope, I'm done. I'm not done with this. They're coming close. They, uh, they're they're slowly sneaking in. 
My proposition didn't work. Nope, I'm not doing it. And she just left. And she said, I'm not gonna go with I'm not gonna do this shit. I, I respect the move. Um and just I mean, just more and more things. I mean, just someone who hated the the not patriarchy person, I use that word on my Instagram to kind of describe Emma Darcy's character, but that's how you would think of her, right? Like you look at Emma Darcy for 10 seconds, like, she hates the patriarchy. She hates men. She hates the way that men have set the world for centuries. That's almost what ha is happening here, and it's not really men per se. It's kind of like her predecessor, her, her dad, his dad, the kings and the queens and the formalities of kings and queens. She hates that specifically. It's not necessarily a patriarchy, but it is a patriarchy in a way. It, just, it kind of translates to this world. Emma Darcy is a perfect character to portray that. Everything that Renera is supposed to become after a time skip would happen, Emma Darcy is perfect for that. Emma Darcy, is she perfect to be some uh, naive romanticist, um, to be someone that is fucking for actual love and adoration of, of her toy? No. That, that left with with Cold World and Millie Alcox were there, that all was gone. That love, I think, died there. I don't think she loves uh, Valerian Boy. I don't think she loved Harwin. But she loved a good time. And she loved shitting and spitting on everything that Thor's about to be in a way that isn't obvious. Because she still does at least seem to have some level of care about what it looks like to keep the Targaryen name going. Like the, the duties that her dad has passed on to her on the most fundamental level, she's willing to go through those and entertain them. But if it's compromising what she wants to live, bro, she wants to basically do it the way that dude would do it. Uh, any guy would be able to do it. And She's going to keep on doing it for the foreseeable future, although now she's gone, which I have a feeling that with the events that took place at the end of this episode, she will be coming back. And now I watch the preview, that's just my feeling. So I think that's pretty much all of Major Rhaenyra stuff. Um, mother now, enemy to Allison Cook, or <laughs> Allison Cook, Olivia Cook, Allison Hightower. Um, seems to be in, a, I guess, a decent spot with the father. Uh, we didn't see really much one-on-one -on -one dialogue with her father. I don't think any, really. Uh, we didn't see any dialogue with her brother, Aegon Targaryen. Um, Aegon Targaryen. Uh, so we didn't really see anything. We saw a lot of uh, Allison. We saw a lot of Harwin. Only saw one scene with Cole. I think those things we're going to see a lot more of going forward. We'll see. That's for Nera's character. Uh, let me 